Did you know there are so many methods of baptism being practiced today? In fact, in tonight's presentation, Pastor Cox will share with us 14 different ways people are being baptized. The subject of baptism is often misunderstood. Tonight, we'll look together at what the Bible has to say about it. Must you be baptized in order to be saved? What are the purpose and meaning of baptism? Our Dimensions of Prophecy presentation tonight is of vital importance to you. So please join us as we go directly to the crusade with Kenneth Cox for tonight's presentation, 14 Ways to Be Baptized. I'd like to welcome each of you tonight. Appreciate you being here. If you and I were to knock on the door of a dozen different churches and just ask them what they believed about baptism, we could easily receive a dozen answers. One church might say, well, we believe in triune immersion, three times face forward. Another church might say, well, we believe in sprinkling, spring a little water on the person. Another church might say, well, our mode of baptism is pouring. We pour water on the person. Another church may say, well, we believe in baptism by immersion one time. Another church will tell you that they practice what is called the baptism of desire. Just the fact that the person wants to be baptized is all that's necessary. Another church will tell you that they baptize with a little bit of salt. Another church will say, well, we baptize with a few drops of oil. Another church would tell you that they baptize by the laying on of hands. Another church will tell you they will baptize you any way that you want to be. And there's another church that will baptize you by mail. All you have to do is just write in. They'll baptize you by mail. And so you can see tonight there are many, many different ideas about baptism, what the Bible has to say about it. And what you and I need to do tonight is we need to go to the Scripture we need to find out just exactly what does God's Word have to say about it. I'd like for you just to par away any preconceived ideas you might have, anything that you may have heard, anything that you may have read, and let's just kind of open our hearts and let's let the Holy Spirit guide and lead us as we look at the Scripture. That little poem that I mentioned to you. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible? This my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the Bible to me? And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're just going to open up the Scripture, and we're going to see exactly what it has to say about it. The best place that I know to start is in the book of Ephesians, and it has this to say, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. When it says here in Ephesians, one baptism, it isn't talking about the number of times. Because in our study tonight, we're going to see where some people were baptized twice. So we're not talking about the number of times. When it says one baptism, it's talking about the manner, the mode, the way the Scripture taught that baptism was to take place. Now, I find that people uh, study their Bible many different ways. There are some people that their way of studying the Bible is that they just read it, pick it up, read it. It's the way they study it. Uh, there's other people that, as they read it, they underline, you know. And there's some people that they not only read it and underline, but they write out in the margins and everything else. Uh, I, I don't know how you study your Bible, but tonight as we go through it, I'm going to mention some words that you might like to underline when it's talking about baptism. Let's see what the Scripture has to say. It says, And John also was baptizing in Aon near Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now, it says that John was baptizing in this particular spot on the Jordan River 
For what reason? Because there was much water there. You see, I grew up believing that the Jordan River was a great big river. Did you ever sing this song? You know, they used to sing it years ago called Row, Jordan Row. They sang that, and man, when I was a kid, I could see it, it was a big river, you know. Well, when I got over to Israel, I found out Jordan isn't that big. You can step across it some places. So John was baptizing in Aon, that particular spot, because there was much water there. So baptism requires much water. Underline it in your Bible. Baptism requires much water water that's what it says this particular spot now let's listen as it talks about the baptism of jesus came to pass in those days that jesus came from nazareth of galilee and was baptized by john where in the jordan underline it baptized in the jordan it says goes on and immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens open, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Underline it. They came up out of the water. It says that Jesus and John went down into the Jordan River. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. And then it says they were coming up out of the water. That's what it's telling you clearly what's happening when it's talking about baptism. Let's look at one more says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan went out to him, referring to John the Baptist, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. See, it says they were baptized in the Jordan. First few years of my life was spent in Chicago, Illinois. Started the school there. And the school that I went to, there was a little man, a little Greek, man and he had a little cart that he pushed and he would push it up there by our school and on that cart he had some waffle irons had them hooked up to a battery and he would make waffles make them nice and crisp and brown and then he had melted butter and he had a brush and he would brush melted butter on those waffles and then he had a flour sifter you know one of those old flour sifters and he would put sh powdered sugar in that and he would sift powdered sugar on those waffles and he would sell them to us children. It ruined me. That's the only way I like waffles to this day, you know. But on that little cart that he pushed around, he also had donuts that he sold and he dipped those donuts in a chocolate syrup. And as children, we would all gather around him because we liked to listen to him talk. And we would ask him what he did with those donuts, and he would tell us that he baptizoed it. You see, that word baptizo means to be put under. When it says they were baptized in the Jordan, it's literally saying they were put under in the Jordan. That's what it's saying. That's what the word means. They were put under in the Jordan River. Now, the Bible makes it very clear as we look at this question of baptism. Philip, the Holy Spirit has spoken to Philip, and it says this. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, to the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candius, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to what? Worship. Now, let's get the story straight, folks. This man is a believer in God. He's an Ethiopian, but he's come to Jerusalem to worship because he believes in God. He believes in Jehovah. He's there worshiping. All right, let's see what begins to happen. Was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So he's been there to Jerusalem to worship He's on his way home, and as he's riding along in his chariot, he's reading Isaiah the prophet. That text always makes me envious. Because here he is riding along reading. And these crazy chariots we drive, you can't read and drive them. If you do, it's dangerous, you know. The only thing I found out that you can do when you're driving is pray. And the way some people drive, you need to pray, you know. 
But nevertheless, he's riding along there, and he's reading Isaiah the prophet, and it says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his chariot. So Philip is running after his chariot. Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? Asked him the question, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, No, I don't understand what I'm reading. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So Philip gets in the chariot, and they're reading in Isaiah, and they're reading the scriptures there that is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And Philip picks that up, and he begins to tell this Ethiopian all about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a believer in God. He doesn't understand about Christ. Now, as they're riding along there, he understands the prophecy. He sees what's taking place, and he reaches out by faith and accepts Christ. Listen to what happens. And as they went down the road, they came to some what? Some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He said, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Watch clearly, because this is probably one of the clearest scriptures in all the Bible as to how baptism takes place. And he commanded the chair to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Who went into the water? Both of them, Philip and the eunuch, they went down in the water and he baptized him. He put him under. That's what it's saying. Baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and they went on their way rejoicing. So here you have a clear example as to exactly what it says how baptism was to take place. What's the meaning? What is baptism supposed to teach us? What's the purpose of baptism? I want you to notice. It says here in Romans, Romans the sixth chapter in verse three, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his what? Death. So to begin with, it tells us that baptism represents the death of Jesus Christ. As a person is baptized, it's representing the death of Christ. Listen as Romans continues in verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him by baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So it tells us that baptism represents the death. It also represents the burial of Christ. One step farther, Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So it tells me that baptism represents his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Marvelous. You see, that's also what it's supposed to represent to you and me. You see, when I come to Christ, it represents, it means that the old man of sin has died. I have crucified the old man of sin. It's what Paul's talking about when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So the old man is crucified it also represents that all my sins have been buried. Now, you talk about offering you something. What is there that will offer you to wipe your slate completely clean? I find people carrying all kinds of guilt, all kinds of sin on their back. Dear friends, there's no reason in this world for you to carry it for one moment. The Lord's willing just to take care of all of it. You don't have to carry it around. It says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? 
Forgive us our sins. He'll take all those sins and bury them. And then it says we are resurrected to a new life in Jesus Christ. I can tell you, you can start out clean every morning if you want to. That's what it's talking about. That's what baptism represents, what it means. People say, well, uh, aren't there certain things you're supposed to do before you're baptized? Aren't there some conditions before a person's baptized? Yes, there are some conditions before you're baptized. Let's take a look at them. You remember, Paul, Silas are over in the city of Philippi. They've been arrested and they've been thrown into jail. And they've not only been arrested, they've been beaten. And then they've been put in jail, they've been chained in jail. Scripture says they're singing. Paul and Silas are singing. It's about midnight when all of a sudden there's an earthquake. And the windows of the jail fall open. And the doors pop open and the chains fall off their arms. And the guard thinks that he has lost all of his prisoners and he's about to take his life and they said, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And it says that that guard came in and fell down before Paul and Silas and he said, said to them, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. And right there that night, that guard accepted Jesus Christ and in the book of Acts, it says that they took it, the guard took Paul and Silas to his home and it says that they washed their stripes and it says that he and his household were baptized that night. That's what it says. One of the conditions before a person is baptized is they must believe. I must accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. That is a condition of baptism. I must be willing to accept Christ as my personal Savior. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter said that they needed to do what? Repent. Repent is another condition that's to take place before a person is baptized. But let me say a word to you about repentance. Don't go around trying to muster up some repentance. I, I've had people say, Brother Cox, I just don't feel bad enough. Now, I, I, I'm, I don't think I ought to be baptized because I don't really feel sorry enough. That's not your responsibility, friend. Your responsibility is to believe. The Scripture says it is God that giveth repentance. When you and I come to Christ and He comes into our hearts, He will give us repentance. You and I don't need to go around trying to muster it up. As the Lord brings repentance to your heart, then you should repent. Yes. So a person is to believe, he's to repent, and one other thing he's to do. Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So it says that the person is not only to believe, to be, repent, but it says they're also to be taught. But now let me say a word about being taught. That doesn't mean that you need a degree from the seminary. I don't know where people get this idea. Let, let me just tell you, there is not one case, you can't find one case in this book anywhere of a long-term baptism. You can't find it. When that jailer repented, they baptized him when? That night. When the Ethiopian said, I believe that the Jesus is the Son of God, Philip baptized him that day. There's no long-term baptisms in the Scripture. Just not there, friend. True, I need to believe, I need to repent, that's true. But I don't have to have a degree from the seminary. It doesn't take a long time 
to get ready for baptism. Some people want to make baptism graduation. It's not, dear friends. Baptism is where the person begins. It's not where they graduate. We get it all mixed up. When I first went in the ministry, I, uh, I labored under that impression. I thought a person ought to be studied with for six months at least, preferably a year before they were baptized. And I can remember I was preaching this particular weekend, and an old man came to church, came in and had a seat up front. I'd never seen him before. When the church service was over, I was shaking people's hand, and this old man came by, and I shook his hand and asked him his name, and I said, I've not seen you here before. He said, this is my first time. And I said, would you mind if I came by to see you this week? And he said, no, I'd be glad to have you come by, and he gave me his address. And that week, I went by to visit the old man. And I said to him, I said, I've never seen you at church before. You said this was your first time. How come you to come to church? Oh, he said, when I was a teenager, about 17 years old, he said, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Gave my heart to him, and he said, I went to church every week. He said, I love church, and I love the Lord. And he said, then in my early 20s, I met this young lady, and he said, we started going together, and I fell in love with her. And he said, uh, I didn't realize it, but she wouldn't go to church. She would have nothing to do with church. And he said, I went to church every week, and every week I came back, she gave me troubles. And he said, that went on for a number of years until I just quit going. And he said, I haven't gone to church in years. The old man was in his late 70s. And he said, two weeks ago, my wife died. And he said, I decided to go back to church. And he said, that's why I'm there. And in my heart, I said, uh, would you like to study? I, I, I was thinking, and I said to him, would you like to study? And really what I was thinking is, well, this time you'll know it. See, I was going to give him a long course. And he said, sure. He said, I'd love to study. And so I gave him an assignment. Man, the assignments I gave him, he could have gotten a degree from the seminary. And I gave him Acts, the second chapter, one day to study. And he read it and studied it. And that week I went back and I was reviewing it with him. And as we were talking, he said, Brother Cox, as I was reading this chapter, it says there that 3,000 were converted in one day and they baptized them. And I said, that's right. And he said, well, if Peter would have put them through what you put me through, there wouldn't have been 3,000. <laughs> you know, and I learned, <laughs> began to understand. There's just not anything such as a long-term baptism in Scripture. Now, let me make something real clear as we move on. And I want to say, for the sake of folks here with small children, with babies, I'm going to make a statement now. Please, I beg of you, just hang on. I'll make it absolutely clear. When it says that it requires that a person believe, they repent, and they be taught, that pretty much leaves out infants. It's very hard for a baby to believe. It's very hard for a baby to repent when it has nothing to repent of. And it's very hard for a little baby to be taught. And there's some of you saying, but Brother Cox, if my baby wasn't baptized and it was to die, it'd be lost. Please, I beg of you, just hang on. I'll answer that in just a moment. I want you to understand that. Notice that the Scripture compares baptism to marriage. It makes that comparison. It says this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. See, it's making the comparison there with baptism. You see, marriage is when a person commits publicly, a public declaration, I am publicly declaring that I'm committing my life to another individual. That's marriage. That's what it's all about. You publicly are telling people you're committing your life to this other person. That's what marriage is. That's also what baptism is. Public Baptism is a public declaration that I have committed my life to Jesus Christ. 
That's what baptism, that's why God makes the comparison with it. I run on to people sometimes, ask them about baptism, and I say, have you been baptized? And they say, uh, Mother says that three of us, there were five children, and three of us were baptized, and two of us weren't. The next time I see Mother, I'll have to ask her. Now, can you just imagine asking somebody if they're married, and they say, I don't know. The next time I see Mother, I'll have to ask her. No. See, it's a public declaration of the commitment of my life to Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. Now, Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, when he says, unless a person is born of water, he's referring here to baptism. And of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And there's people that say, oh, that doesn't mean that. I don't think we need to argue with the words of Jesus. I don't think we need to do that. Jesus said that you and I need to be baptized to enter the kingdom of God. You say, well, what about people that never have the opportunity? What about the person who has a deathbed repentance? What about that person? What about the young man out on the firing lines and he uh, gives his heart to the Lord and he's killed before he can get some place to be baptized? What about a child, a baby, who dies before it reaches the age of accountability? Are these all lost? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought, why was Jesus baptized? Did Jesus need to repent of his sins? Huh? No, he never sinned, not even so much as in thought. So he wasn't being baptized to have his sins washed away. You say, well, for an example, wasn't the example of the disciples good enough? Yeah, I mean, the disciples were baptized. There's, isn't that enough? Why was Jesus baptized? Do you remember he came down the river? Saw John, he said, John, I need to be baptized of you. And John said, what are you talking about? I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes, let alone baptize you. And Jesus said, John suffered to be so to fulfill all righteousness. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about cases like the thief on the cross. Never had that opportunity, he said, John, I need to be baptized for that person. So in the judgment, he can say, Father, credit this man with my baptism. For that person has a deathbed repentance. He said, suffer to be so to fulfill all righteousness. For that baby who never grows old enough to make a decision, to come to the age of accountability, Christ can say, Father, my baptism covers this. It's what it's for. It's what it's talking about. And I can tell you right now, to that mother and that father, you don't have to worry about that baby. That baby is completely safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. When that child reaches the age that it can make a decision, then it needs to make the decision in behalf of Christ. This is what he's talking about. Paul, Paul has made his way over to the city of Ephesus. There's a preacher in Ephesus by the name of Apollos. Paul, Apollos is left and Paul has come there. And this is what happened. It says it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul having passed through the upper regions came to Ephesus and finding some what? Disciples, these are followers, these are believers, these are people that follow the Lord. That's what it's talking about. Now listen to the conversation. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, we've not so much as heard where there's a Holy Spirit. He said, what are you talking about, Paul? We never heard of the Holy Spirit. Paul gets very serious with them. And he said to them, Unto what then were you baptized? He said, Who baptized you? And they said, Unto John's baptism, John the Baptist. 
Then Paul said, John indeed baptiz baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. He said, oh yes, John taught you that you would repent, but he didn't teach them about the Holy Spirit. And so Paul takes the time to teach them what they don't understand. Now listen. And when they heard this, they were what? Baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here's people who've been baptized twice. You see, there are times when people need to be baptized again. There's times when people have come to Christ and have never understood what the Bible taught. They don't understand discipleship. They don't understand following the Lord. And there are times when people like that need to be baptized again. There are times when people were baptized different than the Scripture teaches. And let me make something clear here. Let's say that your mother or your father took you and had you baptized some way different than the Scripture teaches. God respects that. God honored that because your mother and father were probably doing the very best thing that they knew. They were trying to do that which was right. But when you and I come to the place where we understand what God's Word says, then we need to follow the Lord. And we need to be baptized the way the Scripture teaches. Now, there are cases where people have come to Christ, they've been baptized like the Bible teaches, and after a time they have left the Lord. And I'm not talking about stumping your toe. I'm not talking about when you do something wrong. I'm talking about when somebody forsakes the Lord and they go out and leave the Lord and they live in the world and they don't follow the Lord. And then several years later, they decide to come back to the Lord. That person probably ought to be baptized again. So there are cases when people should be baptized again, a second time. All right. It says, Peter... Peter makes a very, very interesting illustration about baptism here. Who formerly, speaking of the time of the flood, who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through what? Water. Now he says here, eight people were saved through water. Now listen to the comparison that Peter makes. There is also an antitype which now saves us, namely, what? Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he's saying that the ark and the flood and baptism are similar. What's he talking about? Well, you see, the ark was the vehicle by which you got from the old world to the new one. And when those people walked up that gangplank into that ark, that was a public declaration that they were placing their lives in the hand of God. So, baptism is the vehicle by which I declare of my faith in God that gets me from this old world to the new one. Say, baptism is a public declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism is a very, very beautiful service. It's people have all their sins washed away. They stand absolutely clean in Christ Jesus. You know, when I became a Christian, I accepted Christ, but I didn't understand some things about following. And uh, I accepted Christ, but uh, I wanted to run my own life. You ever been there? Huh? You know, you ever said, well, I can handle this. <laughs> I I'm perfectly capable of taking care of myself. And so I accepted the Lord, but I really kind of wanted to run my own life. And so I started down the highway of life, and uh, I did everything that I could 
to live a good life, to stay on the road, you know, to do things that were right. I was serious about it. But for the life of me, I constantly ran into the ditch. I mean, I would make every effort to go down that road, wind up in the ditch over and over. And I would tell myself, you've got to do better than this. You can't continue to do this. And I can remember one time I had ran into the ditch. I'd gotten out. I was discouraged, despondent. And I just said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to get the victory over this. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to continue to live like this. And I mean, I made a definite decision. I wouldn't do that again. And I started down the road of life, and I was doing pretty good. Looked up ahead, and over the top of the hill came this truck. As he got closer, I could notice he was on my side of the road. I thought, well, he'll get over. But he didn't. I mean, he just stayed on my side of the road and just coming right down at me. I said, this can't be true. I mean, why doesn't, why doesn't he get over? But boy, he just bore right down on me. And in the last minute, I went in the ditch. And as the truck went by, I saw the driver. He had a pitchfork in his hand and an empty smile, and he waved at me as he passed. Man, I was shaken. I mean, I was really shaken. And I was trying to get out of the ditch when this fellow walked up. He said, uh, you need some help? And I said, I sure do. And he helped me get out of the ditch. And I said, would you like a ride? And he said, sure would. And we got in the car and started down life's road a little ways, and I hadn't gone too far until I was in the ditch again. And uh, he helped me get out, and he said, would you like for somebody to drive for you? And I said, yeah, I sure could use somebody. And so he got behind the wheel. I've never seen anybody drive like that. I mean, he just went right down the road, no bobbles, nothing. Now, he was different. He was dressed in white. His hands had scars on them. But he could really drive. And I watched him a little while, and I said, uh, I think I want to drive. And he said, sure, and he just pulled over, scooted over, and I got behind the wheel, and I was sure now that I knew how. We started down the road. It wasn't very long, and I was back in the ditch. And I said to him, I said, uh, you better drive again. And he got behind the wheel, and we started down the road, and we were doing fine. And I looked up ahead, and over the hill came that truck. And I said to him, I said, you see that truck? He said, yes. I said, I guess you've noticed it's on our side of the road. He said, yes. I said, you just might as well pull over into the ditch here. Because I've been here before. I've met that truck before, and he's not getting over it. And instead of pulling over, he just pressed down on the accelerator, headed for that truck. And I said, you can't do that. I said, this old boy doesn't. He doesn't get over. He's going to stay right there. And he didn't say anything to me. He just headed for the truck. And I said, we're going to have the biggest collision you've ever seen in your life. This, this won't work. And I mean, the truck would just beaming down on us and finally I said I can't take it anymore and I closed my eyes and prepared and all I heard was a whishing sound and I opened my eyes and looked and the truck was in the ditch and we were going right on down the road and I looked at him and I said will you drive for me all the time and oh dear friend let me tell you as long as he's in the driver's seat as long as I leave my life in his hands there's no problem. He can handle it. He knows how to drive. And he'll do that for each one of you. As we place our lives in his hands, he'll care for us, direct us, and guide us. That's what baptism's all about. It's making a public declaration that I've placed my life in the hands of Jesus Christ. And dear friends, he'll just take your sins, wash them, and make you clean. Listen as Steve sings. While they're picking up your slips, 
A lot's happening tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 8.15, our subject is Christ our Righteousness. Uh, you know, I don't know what to say to you. Tomorrow is a full day. Why don't you just go home tonight and get a good night's rest and plan on coming and spending all day? I don't know what else to tell you because you don't want to miss tomorrow morning's subject. Christ our righteous is a subject you just don't want to miss. And so we hope you'll be there for that. Then at, listen to me, at 11 o'clock, I'm going to preach on two weeks to be a Christian. Have you ever had somebody say to you, you got to be born again? Huh? Ever had anybody tell you that? Did you know what they were talking about? Now, I'm not asking if you experienced I asked you if you knew what they were talking about. I promise you, when you walk out here tomorrow, 12, 12, 15, whenever we get through, never again in your life will you ever wonder what it means to be born again. I promise that. You'll know exactly what it means to be born again. So you don't want to miss 11 o'clock. And then they're going to have uh, Steve and Sylvia and Judy playing the harp here, and they're going to have a concert at 2.30. You don't want to miss that. And then tomorrow evening at 7.30, our subject is Adam's mother's birthday. Now, I know what you're saying. You say, I didn't know that Adam had a mother. Well, I promise you tomorrow night I'll tell you who Adam's mother is. Is that fair enough? Tell you who Adam's mother was? So, you want to be here? You want to wear something red. Now, if you don't have anything red, don't stay home. Okay? But if you got something red, wear it. And we're going to have a cake up here. And when you come in, we're going to give you a slip of paper and let you put your name on it, and we're going to draw a name and give somebody that cake. So we're going to have a good time tomorrow night. You don't want to miss tomorrow evening. So we hope that all of you will be back with us again tomorrow evening. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the marvelous love and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thankful for each one here. Bless them as they go to their home. Bring them back safely tomorrow. May all of us place our lives in your hands, walk with thee all the way into the kingdom. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good night. God bless each one.